I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. If you love listening to this show as much as I love hosting it, I think you'll really like the Medal of Honor podcast produced in partnership with the Medal of Honor Museum. Each episode talks about a genuine American hero and the actions that led to their receiving our nation's highest award for valor. They're just a few minutes each, so if you're looking for a show to fill time between these Warriors episodes, I think you'll love the Medal of Honor podcast. Search for the Medal of Honor podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Chief Master Sergeant Doug Morell, nicknamed The Legend. Morell was a combat cameraman who accompanied flight crews during missions. It was his job to photograph or film the missions so that the operation's execution could be evaluated afterwards. In this final part of his interview, Morell recounts serving in various conflicts after World War II and tells the story of how he was shot down for a third time in Vietnam. In the Korean War, I was in RB-36s. That was a reconnaissance airplane. With, uh, the RB-36 was the peacemaker. It had six pusher engines and two jets on each wing. So you had four jets and six pushers. And they were big. It was a big airplane. It was the biggest they ever had, had at that time. Uh, our targets were all in Russia and uh, China. And we would have never come back. Of course, at that time, they were all classified, but they, that's all done now. We don't have to worry about that. But we would have never got back. So we had severe survival training all the time. Survival, survival, survival. Every time you traded, you changed a crew. You'd have to go through survival again with that crew for crew integrity, they called it. But uh, Korea, no, uh, none of our airplanes went over there. Earlier, we had some of our uh, B-50s which are uh, RB-50s, RB-29s, which they also had in uh, Project Crossroads, the bomb tests. But uh, they were over there. But uh, we just got transitioned to these new B-36s, and we didn't go. But we practiced 30-hour missions. Well, the people say the only way you'd ever get down from a B-36 is to shoot it down. And you're up there forever, it seems like. Of course, we have bunks. <laughs> But that uh, Korean War, I went in in 1952. I had a five-year break between 47 and 52. And that was because uh, I went back in for the Korean War. And uh, I got immediately went back in on flying status aerial photographer again. But in the RB-36, we had 20, 30 cameras in there. And uh, it was, and we also had the FICON system which was a, a small, or the RF-84K, which was, oh gosh, I forget its name, but it's a F-84K, meant that it, that it had a hook on the front that retracted. It had two pins that uh, retracted and went out. So uh, we'd put down this, and the cameraman had to do this. We'd put down this trapeze, would come down like that. Then there's an arm that came out like this, and then this, had a thing like that. The pilot would go down. The pilot would fly in between that and hook on. Then we'd lock him up and bring him up inside the airplane. And we had to uh, reload his cameras and refuel him and uh, give him a walk around bottle. He loved it. He'd come up in there and he'd say, God, coffee in the airplane. This is great. You know, it was quite a deal, but it wasn't in combat. So, but we were ready anytime. The B-36 was a deterrent more than anything else because it could go nuclear-equipped, everything, nuclear. And it could go anywhere. We could fly halfway around the world and back. Well, the, going into Korea, having the five-year break between World War II and Korea put me into Vietnam, uh, eligible for Vietnam. 
after I got out of B-36s, uh, they sent me down to Panama. I spent five years in Panama documenting civic actions. There'd be medical civic actions and uh, construction civic actions, a lot of, but we were really building up the rapport between the United States and all these Central and South American countries. I visited every one of them down there. I mean, I had a job in every single one of them. And uh, I, I was a tech sergeant when I went down, and I had a chief master sergeant uh, line number when I came back, which means that uh, that those three letters I had of commendation from three different presidents in South America didn't hurt anything. <laughs> But anyhow, when I went back from uh, there, they sent me back to uh, Colorado Springs to the Air Defense Command there. And uh, they had a need for uh, documentation of the Russian bear bombers that were coming down from, uh, from the North Sea way up there. And they were coming back. They were coming down and over our, our fleet and stuff, and their electronic... Uh, gatherers they gather the the frequencies and stuff so we're up there to document them uh, to show that they're still a threat from uh, russian bombers so they sent me to iceland for six months and uh, i documented about 25 or 30 uh intercepts up there and uh that's going right up uh, we're flying in in f-102s the delta dart it's a side-by-side -side aircraft Side by side, you're sitting side by side, and so the pilot's over here, so you can shoot real well up there. Well, I, I had several opportunities to get the Russians uh, up there. We went in real close, and uh, this is almost combat, because at one time, uh, this tail gunner up there and this Russian bomber had his guns stowed like this, and he lowered them like that. The minute he did that, my pilot... Uh, hit his, uh, his prepare-to-fire missile, and he's got these missiles underneath, and the doors fly open down this missile gobes, and it's sitting there like that, and the guy's tail gun went back up again like that. So, But other times we'd be flying again, uh, documenting these uh, Russian bears, and we'd show them up the front, and here's a guy up the front, and he's saying, let's see, what's the matter, you know? And he's, so we'd, we'd go back, go back there, and this guy halfway back in a window with a camera. So this guy's saying, go back there, and we go back away, and he goes, click, he says. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Here's, here's cameramen on opposite, opposite sides of the, of the world and opposite sides of the, of the even the opposite sides of our cultures. And he's telling me to come on over so we can get a better picture of us. And, oh, it's funny. It was funny, and... and we did document those, and they'd keep sending the the same airplanes over with different numbers on because we'd go up and we'd document their their rivet pattern. We'd go right underneath them. I'd shoot straight up to document the pattern. But uh, after that, well, I, after I spent the six months up there, I got the call for Vietnam. So uh, I went over there, went to survival at uh, Clark, Clark Air Force Base. I took, went through the survival school there, went on over to uh, Thailand. They put me in Thailand at Karat. And uh, we weren't getting too good of a coverage from, uh, from a lot of the bases. So I was starting to go around to all the bases and, and check and see how, see, uh, fly a couple of missions, see what they were doing. Well, uh, the first mission I went over there, I went to NKP, which is Nakam Phnom. It's up on the on the uh, river, uh, just across from Laos. Anyhow, we went up there uh, in a O2. This is a forward air controller airplane. It has a, a pusher engine in the front, Super Skymaster Cessna. It has an engine in the front pulling and an engine in the rear pushing. So uh, we're up there about a half hour. Uh, flying over to Laos. We were going over to uh, photograph uh, these, these uh, what they call sensors. And we dropped these sensors on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, these sensor drops are, are like a javelin. They're about, oh, I'd say two, three feet long. And an airplane will fly right directly over the trail, and it'll drop a string of those. And as this string goes down, you know, 
we're supposed to photograph it so we can see the actual position on the ground where they go in. I mean, uh, they can tell it later on. They can develop our film, check it out. They can see exactly where those sensors go. Well, if there's activity on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, even guys on bicycles or any activity, it will uh, start these sensors uh, broadcasting. They, when they bury themselves in the ground, they have a tail, a green tail. It looks like a plant coming out, but it's the antenna. So uh, any noise would start them operating. And when they operate, they send out a beep signal. Well, they'd have these beep signals that'd be... Uh, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, or a combination of what from what, what started out. So they'll know exactly where that one was because they know what beep that one's putting out. Anyhow, the airplane didn't show up. We're still flying around there in this O2. All of a sudden, we had four bursts of flak. And uh, it went bing, 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 bing. And the fourth one hit us on the left wing. And it knocked the left wing off, and set the stub on fire. And the pilot says, bail out. And I reached down. I'd, I'd just been briefed. And I reached down. And I grabbed the, the handle down there. And the whole side of the airplane came out. The pilot had to go out my side. So uh, we were, both of us were rolled around in a strut that goes from the bottom of the airplane to the wing. It's a high wing airplane. And uh, we were... We were both rolled around. He was knocked out. I was knocked out temporarily. Uh, I felt, I woke up, I imagine, a couple of seconds afterwards. But he went uh, all the way down. And uh, when he opened up, he only had about one swing. And then he hit the ground and broke his legs. So uh, I opened up about, uh, I don't know what altitude. We were at 5,000 feet. And I opened up about two or three seconds after we bailed out, I guess. But I, I didn't even uh, know it until I looked out. And I says, uh-oh, <laughs> we better pull this. So uh, when I bailed out that time, I said, oh, no, not again, you know. And just almost that casually. But uh, it was funny. In a way, it was funny. <laughs> Anyhow, I opened up and uh, I could see down right below me. There was a gun, the gun that shot at us was was firing. And he was firing at me. And you'd see a ball of fire come out from down there, and it'd go like, it looks like it's coming right at you. And so it comes right up at you like that, and then it pulls off one side or the other. You know, it's it's a, kind of the perspective that you get, but it's it's disconcerting. Anyhow, I, uh, they fired for a while, and then they finally says, well, we're not getting him any, so they... I swung my chute just in case. I thought, well, heck, maybe I'll swing into it. So I stopped. But uh, I looked down there, and there were people coming out of this place. It was a truck park. It's a little place called Chapone, a sleepy little village of Chapone where more people have been shot down than anywhere else. But uh, anyhow, this truck park and uh, a, a garage and a night park for the daylight park for the trucks that travel at night. So I uh, saw all these people coming out. It looked like I was going to land right there. I could see where the pieces of the airplane coming down all around me. And I could see where they, where they were coming out. So I, just, just like I did in World War II, I pulled on my chute risers. And I uh, sailed along. I saw a tree out there in the jungle sticking up by itself. I had to hit that tree, and I don't know why. But I hit the tree and I went in, I went in uh, real fast and my chute collapsed and I just went, I felt a momentary tug and then I went down, straight down. It was a high jungle canopy and it's uh, 40 or 50 feet at least up in there, maybe 80 feet. But uh, I felt that momentary tug and then I went straight down and on the way down my right heel hit a limb and it shattered the, the bone the talus, the bone that you're in your ankle that everything swivels on. So uh, anyhow, it just felt like a big numbing more than anything else. And I landed and uh, about, as I imagine I fell about 40 feet. I'm all jarred up and everything, but I got out of my uh, outfit. It says, survival training says, go uphill, you know, Go away from the people, go uphill, because that's where the helicopters can pick you up easier. 
So I'm going through this uh, jungle. I come on, I go straight ahead, kind of a halfway trail. And I, I came on this truck park. You could see the, the trucks down in there. And so I says, I can't go there. So I went back. I looked around. There was no way to go up. It was just flat level all over. So finally, I saw a way. I got down low to the ground. I saw a slight rise, and I headed out that way. And I walked on this broken angle. You don't realize it, but you were talking about adrenaline a while back, you know. Uh, that adrenaline comes, and it, it makes a beautiful splint for you. I didn't even feel that leg hurting at all. And uh, anyhow, I got up in, into an area there and hid in some tall grass. Uh, I hid in there, uh, got down, got my radio out, and called up. Uh, there was an O, let's see, OV-10, uh, which is, I forgot what they call those two, but this is OV-10 reconnaissance, or forward air controller airplane. So I did get in contact with this forward air controller airplane, and uh, I talked to him. He says, where are you? I says, I'm on the ground. He says, well, where are you? I says, I says, I haven't the slightest idea. So I described the area around. He says, well, the place is full of a, full of a areas like that. So finally, I says, I hear him. So I guided him in with my radio. I says, make a left turn. And he came. And I said, now you're over me right now. So he whipped down on his wing and he says, oh, you down there in that clearing? I said, oh, no. These guys have got my pilot. They got his radios, everything else. So. I tried not to talk to him anymore. Well, by that time, the rescue force had, had come in. And he did report that we were down, you know, and the rescue force came in. And uh, they had uh, five, what they call A1E fighters, Sandys, and uh, Navy fighters. And they came in and they sprayed our area around there, sprayed it all around. And I told them where to go and, and I heard, Told them the whole works on there. There was it was defended by six guns, six aircraft guns around there. There was five uh, uh, thirty-seven uh, millimeter guns, and then there was a what they call a quad forty, which was four machine guns in one turret that operated. So, so I had to show where all of these guns were by telling them on the radio. So uh, I told them over about forty yards ahead where I was. I was within about about 100 yards each place. And I said, uh, well, there's one straight ahead, about 40 yards out. And he says, okay. So he says, keep your head down, sprayed it, sprayed it with mini guns and, and went by with bombs too. So I had to, about the time they sent in a 100, F-100, a jet, so they could, uh, what do you call it, nape on it. So they're going to nape on this area. So... This one gun, they couldn't get it. The one gun wasn't firing it properly, but it was still firing. So they sent in uh, Napon. <laughs> and they, uh, a minute he went over and, and went off the other side while everything broke loose. And so I had to, I was very busy trying to show all these six guns in there. I didn't know they were there. I only knew one was in there. So I called them in and they put them out. So we got rid of six guns and then they, then they sent the Jollies in, the Jolly uh, Green Giant, which is a hel rescue helicopter. And he came in uh, off the side. I saw him coming in out there. I guided him in, guided him over me, took off. Uh, well, I waited until the jungle penetrator hit the ground because it has static electricity, and I had to let it ground out. So I got on that uh, jungle penetrator, something that's tied to a cable to the helicopter. So I got on the jungle penetrator, and it stuck me right on up. Uh, I tied the, the belt around my shoulder so I wouldn't fall out if I was shot on the way up. We went up there, no shots, no nothing. And uh, they rescued me. I, they took off right like that. On the way back, I had plenty of cold water. I had an old rusty hamburger that was left in there for three days, cheeseburger. Best one I ever had. NKP, they got me off there, and everybody's standing around congratulating me. The doctor's checking me out. Uh, they put me on a uh, stretcher, finally. Took me in the, in the ambulance to the hospital, but 
It was kind of funny when I when I was first out there. I, this Catholic priest says, "Well, we were praying for you, son." And I was about ten years older than he was. I think I was fifty at this time. And I says I, he says, "Well, I was praying for you, son. We were praying for you." And uh, got along a little bit farther. Why? We had another one says, well, we're praying for you, son. You know, another uh, uh, chaplain comes along. He said, we're praying for you, son. And I found out later that uh, my hooch gal in Korat had put a, at least the one that takes, does all your laundry, to, wakes up your bed, and it's a maid. I found out that she had uh, put a little wreath of flowers on Buddhist temple, so I had all three of them working for me. So he says, when I got to the hospital in Clark, I told the the chaplain about that and he says uh, I says which one of those you think did the most good chaplain he says I think knowing how to use that radio and that survival compass did you the most good he says the good lord helps those who help themselves so I spent three months in the hospital there and then they sent me back to states and that was Vietnam With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep, it's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard, and I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah. I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine. A new kind of Chromebook. Shooting combat camera in Vietnam was, a lot of it was chase. We did an awful lot of chase stuff. We'd get in the back seat of F-100s. And as the airplanes would go, you know, they always go in twos when they're making a, uh, a bombing attack or, or a strafing attack. But they'd go in twos. One would, what they call chase the other, one would be right behind like this. Well, the cameraman would be in, in the chase. Well, this guy would go first, and then they'd switch, and he'd be the chase. But we, a cameraman would be in one, so we could show uh, where the bombs fell, how it fell, get some quick bond damage assessment and things like that. So we did a lot of, uh, we had a lot of guys. I had 400 and some guys on flying status in Vietnam, so as cameramen. Both still and motion, so way different than World War II. And we had better equipment, too, so uh, it was a lot better. We did shoot with, uh, we didn't shoot 35 millimeter. We shot 16 millimeter in Vietnam. And uh, the camera being smaller and everything else made it a lot easier. Well, see, in World War II shooting, we, we were in almost in, invariably in bombers. And uh, this was the first time, you know, we were the only enlisted men qualified to, to fly in, uh, in high-performance aircraft, jets and things. So there was a big difference was our, our shooting platform. Uh, 
wasn't with the getting all pictures of the gun gutters going and the bombs falling and all that. It was shooting the next plane doing it. So uh, it was completely different. It wasn't high altitude bombing. It was low altitude strafing and, and bombing and dropping uh, napalm, whatever. Oh, yeah, we had color all the time. We had ECN, uh, Eastman Color Negative, it was called. And uh, everything was color in that. We didn't have any black and white, except they had for some instrumentation things they used black and white. But uh, for all of our documentation was color. And we even uh, put our cameras on the fighters at certain angles. So when they do that when, without a cameraman in it, we were shooting bomb damage assessment. So uh, you see some of them where, where you you can see pictures of Vietnam today where where you can see the airplanes going backwards and you see these bombs hitting. Well, we have a camera all set up for that and all fastened to the airplane for that. And though, uh, because you just couldn't turn around that and get those clear pictures like that. So uh, it's a lot different. Yeah, we did, we did it. And uh, we had a fast turnaround time. We turned around... Uh, We'd come back from a mission five minutes later, give them, a, give them a, a quick, not five minutes, but come back from a mission and, and within, say, about an hour and a half, we would uh, have a turnaround, have the pictures, have a, a rough cut print already out to, to intelligence and to the, to the commander of the, of the fighter squadron, whichever. So it was very fast. We had uh, laboratories over there in trailers. So everything was all fixed up, raring to go. You got on the ground, they'd rush out, grab your stuff and run with it because you didn't take it to the lab, they took it right out of here. So it was a pretty good. With the 16 millimeter, we had a little more time we could shoot too. A lot more time. You ever lost that handle in World War II? If you ever lost that handle, you were in trouble because uh, you had no way to crank that, that spring up. <laughs> I probably survive all the time because everybody up there likes me. <laughs> That was Chief Master Sergeant Doug Morrell. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. For updates and more, follow us on Twitter at team underscore Harbaugh. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rule Hoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today.